Um, my name is Katrin. I am going to moderate this panel and we are going to talk about just and sustainable digital futures um, with really amazing panelists that I'm going to introduce in a bit. Um, why are we here or why are these panelists here? Um, in the program, we thought we really want some people who are already working on these um, just and sustainable digital futures so that are actually showing um, that another world is possible and that there are already some projects and approaches that we can maybe build upon that give us some hope um, to yeah, actually making these sustainable and just futures. So I'm super happy that you're all here. Before I start, I want to briefly um, introduce the topic. Um, the idea behind this panel is that we are in a world where there's a lot of emerging technologies that come with a lot of um, promises and narratives, such as bringing freedom, bringing equality, um, or bringing sustainability. Yet, um, a lot of people all around the world have also learned that these technologies also can cause harms, both um, socially or environmentally, and um, that it needs a critical assessment of these technologies as well. So, for example, when we're thinking about AI or machine learning solutions that can maybe help um, understand the climate crisis better or data can help understand the climate crisis better, it also comes with a downside of producing CO2 emissions um, or yeah, causing other, other harms. And also um, with green technology, what um, I think Aymara is going to talk a bit about, um, this drive to green technology and to smart devices um, that often comes with the downside that there is a lot of mining of um, rare earths, of lithium, etc., and that really affects indigenous land. So it really needs a basic understanding and um, different perspectives on these topics, and that's why all these panelists today are here. So I'm super happy. And um, I would actually like to start with a question um, how you imagine just and sustainable digital technologies or the internet, whatever you feel like, um, to all the panel, just to kind of understand what your angle is and also to start with a bold vision. So no pressure, but yeah, that would be my first um, question. And I'm going to start with you, Julia. Um, Introducing you, Julia Kloiber. Um, she is the co-founder and execu executive director of Superlab. Um, it's a feminist think tank, would you say? Mm, civil society organization. Civil society organization um, in, based in Berlin. And they have done amazing work on feminism and tech, such as the feminist tech principles, but also a gathering on um, just and sustainable digital futures, which was also the inspiration for this panel. So I'm also curious um, to hear more about this. And Julia um, also initiated a lot of other projects, such as Code for Germany and um, Prototype Fund, yeah. So welcome, Julia, and my question would be, what is your bold vision to kick off this panel? Thanks, Katrin. Um, I was actually in the preparation of this panel, I was a bit struggling with like, what is my bold vision? I think five years ago, I would have probably given you like a set of civic tech tools that we really need in order to increase transparency, in order to work towards more sustainable cities. But since I'm the first one speaking, I want to open up the discourse a bit more because I would claim that there is no just internet in an unjust world, that it is so tempting to look at the quick tech fixes um, without going a layer deeper, without looking at the systemic problems, the root causes of social injustice, of injustices in our society, such as racism, such as social injustices, authoritarianism. And I think it's also important to acknowledge when we talk about tech that all of these things did not come into this world because of technology. That also means that they cannot be resolved with technology alone. Um, and I think this is something that's super important to keep in the back of our mind when we're discussing this, also at this conference where we're trying to bring different topics together. 
We know that a lot of injustices get amplified by technology, like the usage of artificial intelligence in recruiting processes at our borders, um, in scoring systems of uh, insurance companies. And while it's important to mitigate these harms and to understand them better, this is not enough. Um, a just internet or just digital tools start with a society that fights racism, that fights discrimination, that fights hate. A society that stands up for human rights, that stands in solidarity with the women in Iran that are fighting for freedom, that centers around the needs of the most vulnerable groups in our society. And I think these should be the starting points of the discussions that take us away from the superficial layer of where we're trying to fix things with tech. And that is true for the digital rights space as well as the um, sustainability space. And, but then still, like, it's a panel about hope and visions. So I want to tell you about a project by a friend that very much inspired me throughout um, COVID. The friend's name is Abia Gattas. She's uh, Lebanese and lives here in Germany. And she started a project called Hamam Radio, a grassroots community online radio, an uncensored space, this is what she calls it, for communities that have been historically marginalized. And the communities she's part of are feminist communities, are non-binary queer communities in the Swana region, that's the Southwest Asian and North African region. And Hamam, as the name say, says, like points to the spaces, the baths, where people can uh, indulge in self-care and uh, where they have a safe space. Um, and one of the main challenges that Abir saw when it comes to community organizing, organizing um, her communities, is that there is a lack of safer spaces online for community exchange, for community building, um, safer spaces that exist outside the big social media commercial platforms. Um, and usually a lot of this community building gets done offline, people meet in spaces, they exchange, but due to COVID that was not possible for her and her community anymore because these spaces where people could meet offline were shrinking. So the radio, the online radio that she built was a space outside of this highly surveillance and censored social media platform, a space that would allow her communities to share their stories, to talk about topics that are oftentimes still taboos in some of the societies that she's working with, topics such as mental health, um, sexuality, um, women's rights, feminist movements, gender-based violence, and so on. And for her, this online grassroots radio was also a space to share hope, to share love, to share music, to share joy. So not only focusing on all the misery that is surrounding us, but also collectively like talking about hope and love. And I interviewed her, her like two years ago about this radio project, and she said, we learned how to process grief collectively and how to share emotions with each other. We told each other our own stories of violence and trauma. Collectively, we tried to heal. Hamam Radio is our way to regain control and autonomy over our narratives and collective memories to better organize. So for her, this super low-tech tool of an online grassroots radio was a tool that was very empowering for her community. And this is where the sustainability part comes in. We don't always need high-tech platforms. We don't have to, like always start with the social media and try to rethink it, but sometimes the tools are already out there and the tools have been used for communities around the globe for many, many years. So this low-tech tool um, where they gathered, they reached 300,000 listeners in the region and um, on the live radio and many more via recordings um, was such an important tool, a digital tool, but not a high-tech digital tool, not a social media digital tool. So when I think of a just internet of the future, I like to think of this grassroots online radio format, um, a just internet of, of the future that is all about enabling and powering these infrastructures that communities need in order to organize and um, to join together. So this is one example, one vision, but then also discussing, I'm hoping that we're discussing the deeper layers of like what does justice um, and sustainability mean to us. 
Thank you, Julia. Very good um, opening statement already. I'm going to introduce Aymara now. Um, Aymara Janke Sonta. <laughs> and Aymara is a social researcher and a social psychologist. And she also holds a PhD in philosophy um, from the indigenous university Siglo Bainte um, of um, Yayagua in Bolivia. And she um, as well has a postdoc in food sustainability in Latin America and Africa. And currently, Aymara is at the um, Leuphana University in Lüneburg as a full-time lecturer and also as a um, fellow, research fellow, and really looking at, um, at sustainability um, yeah, from a decolonial and feminist perspective. And also, um, Aymara is part of GLEFAS. It's a Latin American group um, for feminist studies. And um, yeah, one of the really interesting angles um, of your work, I would say, is like this sustainability and green technology, but then also this notion of neo-extractivism, which I hope that you can tell us a bit more about. So very welcome. And um, yeah, I would be curious, what would be your bold vision um, of a just, of just and sustainable digital technologies, what's, what's in your mind? Askeru Kipanaya, Hilatanaka, Kulyatanaka. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, today is a day of indigenous futurism. I wanted to start there. Um, because we are talking about the apocalypse. And when we imagine the apocalypse, the, this uh, time where everything collapses, we imagine these apocalypse in the future. But actually for us, that started 500 years ago with the colonization process that connected both worlds, the North and the South. And in this connection, disconnect plurality in our systems. So when we imagine uh, the future, we imagine resistance, responses. Each response comes from First of all, the recognition of this plurality. What means technology for us? What means technology for each one? And who is um, getting the benefit from this technology? So in this case, when we are talking about greenwashing ideas, greenwashing solutions, when we are uh, looking to renewable, uh, reusable energy, when we are thinking in circular um, economy, when we imagine... Um, green cars with biofuel and uh, with lithium in the middle. So I'm going back to the ontology of some components in our system, yeah? Who has to deal with that? In our case, Bolivia is the country who has the biggest uh, reserve of lithium in the world, near to Chile and Argentina. These three countries is a, is a triangle of damage and conflict. And I wanted to talk about that in this plenary, in this session, because we are now in a moment of crisis where policymakers are focusing a lot in green solutions. And it's fundamental that in the middle of these green solutions, we also look for what some people call externalities that we want to put in the center. Life is in the center. Our lives, systems of lives, not just human beings, but the whole system is in the center. The problem of green energy is that e green energy produces inequality, and this is called neo-extractivism. Neo-extractivism is an example of how colonial ideas continue as a tool for building transformation in the future. So when you imagine this future of um, justice, um, social and ecological justice, we want to put in the center this discussion. Yeah? I will stop now uh, with my first uh, intervention and later I can show some data for you to see what I'm talking about. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, Lynn is an Lynn Kark, sorry, is an assistant professor at the Hertie School um, 
in um, computer science and public policy. And Lynn actually is a physicist, so we're trying to bring some um, different disciplines also to, the, to this panel. Um, and her research and teaching focuses on methods from statistics and machine learning to inform climate mitigation policy across the energy sector. And um, Lynn is also the co-founder and chair of Climate Change AI, which is a really, yeah, I would say a really groundbreaking organization that um, help, helps to facilitate the work at the intersection of machine learning and climate action. So it is anchored within, um, within I would say, a social foundation, but it's also really clear in forming um, climate policies and also working with AI technologies or machine learning technologies in order to get to this better future. Um, and previously, um, Lynn Kak was a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer in the Energy Technology and Policy Group at um, ETH Zurich. So, um, yeah, my question is, how would your bold vision look like, um, either with machine learning or also um, with digital technologies in general? What would you like to see? Yeah, thanks. Instead of talking about a bold vision, maybe I can try to introduce some like frameworks to think about also um, sustainability of digital technologies and in particular I am personally interested in climate change mitigation so how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions either with machine learning and other digital technologies um, or also from the technology itself and um, I for the most part I've worked on projects trying to use machine learning as a tool to help with climate change mitigation um, but recently I also looked into the overall footprint, the greenhouse gas emissions footprints of machine learning. And here we introduced a framework which is very similar to um, how people think about digital technologies in general, um, to, to start assessing and quantifying also this impact. And um, we distinguish three different um, aspects from machine learning um, that are relevant here. And the first one is the direct impact, um, which we call computing-related impact. So this emerges when you run AI algorithms. And um, it comes both from training algorithms, but also from inference. So when you are um, using it to do something with your data. And it actually turns out that in many, many areas, this using the algorithms, this inference part is, is the bigger part, even though there's a lot of talk about um, the training phase. And it includes both the energy that's consumed when you are running the um, algorithms in data centers, but also the emissions that are associated with producing um, the hardware, and that's what we already heard about. So there's a, for, especially for small devices, there's a lot of share actually that is attributable to the um, production and the end of life of this hardware. Um, and then the next big part is the indirect impact, and that's when you are using these technologies to do something. And um, We've heard probably throughout the conference of different projects where AI is being used to um, help with sustainability goals. Um, but what people also do, and um, is applying it in all kinds of ways, because it's um, it's a it's a neutral technology in that sense, or it's a it's a tool to do something, and um, it's being applied in the oil and gas sector, for example, to help with extraction and to help with sales of oil and gas. Um, it has like lots of kind of um, areas where it is just meant to reduce costs and not necessarily helping to achieve sustainability goals and probably in some cases also counteracting those. Um, so we distinguish the second area of the immediate application impacts where we look at the positive and the negative kinds of ways that it can be applied throughout the economy. And then um, the last part is uh, the system level impacts. And that indicates that um, the technology itself also has implications on the larger socioeconomic system, um, for example, in ways that you also don't immediately associate with sustainability. So if you are using AI and recommender systems and um, you have targeted advertising, um, you might influence the consumer behavior and might actually have people consume more or consume differently. And that might uh, impact actually greenhouse gas emissions potentially even much more than some of the direct impacts that one is talking about. 
Um, similarly, there are rebound effects, um, there are effects of how the technology might lock us into more carbon intensive technologies. Um, autonomous driving is an interesting example that might enforce individualized um, transportation um, over public transportation, which has huge sustainability implications. So um, the system level impacts should not be overlooked. And that's why we sort of distinguish the immediate and the system level impacts, even though there, there's sort of an artificial distinction because um, oftentimes, yeah, you have to look at the application holistically. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe that helps um, also this discussion. I've only looked at greenhouse gas emissions impacts, but of course there are lots of other environmental impacts such as water and of course social, social impacts can be assessed in a similar way. Um, but that being said, quantification is still really difficult. So we can do this for maybe single projects, um, but to understand the overall footprint of digital technologies and of, um, especially of specific digital technologies is really difficult. Um, there exist numbers for all of um, information and communication technologies. They range in a, in a few percent, um, so maybe one to two, sometimes more percent of overall greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to digital technologies, um, but that's in itself also a pretty uncertain number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, it's also, um, I imagine, really difficult to find this quantification of, of all these different topics. Camilla, I'm gonna um, hand. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, finally, Camilla Nobrega. I'm very happy that you're here as well. Um, Camilla is a journalist and currently a PhD student at the um, gender division of the Free University. Um, she is um, researching on mega projects in social environmental justice through uh, Latin American feminist and queer perspectives. And Camilla also initiated a really cool project called Beyond, que Beyond the Green, a laboratory of transmedia narratives investigating exactly these topics. And Camilla is based between Berlin and Rio de Janeiro, and um, yeah, has published a lot of works around these topics. So I'm very curious about your vision or your thoughts on this topic on building um, just and um, sustainable digital futures. What, what is your vision <laughs> or your thoughts? Well, thank you for the invitation first, and uh, thank you all the other panelists for sharing because it's also nice to be the last because everybody kind of holds the space and we uh, we hold the space for each other, I would say, and give energy to continue. So first thing I would say, usually when we talk about feminisms, people think directly about like a, a specific look on gender, but it also can be... Uh, and, and the, that's the way I, I use to investigate and, and work in, uh, as an activist in articulations and so on, to understand feminisms also as a possibility of unveiling different layers of power. So, uh, so that's my main thing on, on connecting feminisms and social environmental justice lenses. And uh, so in the beginning I thought, okay, if I talk from uh, about Brazil and I thought about if I bring a picture of, for example, the forest burning that I'm pretty sure all of you saw since like 2019 mainly, uh, I thought, okay, what kind of feeling it would bring to people if I showed the, the forest from you know, top down, because <laughs> usually those are the pictures that we see. Uh, and what kind of feeling could it cause in the case I said that satellite images taken between January and June this year show 1,400 square miles of the forest destroyed more than in any six month period in the seven years of recording keeping under the current methodology of the, this is from the Environmental Research Institute or IPA as we call in, in Brazil. It's a Brazilian non-profit. And people like to say 
that that's a very common quote, that this is the extent in four times the size of New York City, because we need to compare everything to New York. You know? uh, and, but I mean, it's a lot, it's still a lot. Also, if in, under the government of Bolsonaro, I can add that the area destroyed in the first half of 2022 is 80% larger than the same period in 2018. This was the, when the government of Bolsonaro started. And one of the reasons that I have to check my notes today is because my mind is very accelerated. Tomorrow is a very important day in Brazil. We have the elections. Um, but what kind of feeling it brings when you see those pictures, like top down, from a forest that is burning. And usually, I have seen, I, living in Germany, I have seen and following and talking many discussions, and even I showed sometimes those pictures. And I felt, okay, something is getting wrong, because in the end, we saw a lot of, like the, the multiplication of projects with the focus on forest conservation, multiplication of projects, even from, for example, big tech companies that, ju that just jumped in to the debate in env on environmental uh, conservation with the aim of, and like mainly, stop or to, to reduce or to uh, compensate, that's a good word that many companies really like, uh, green, green gas houses emissions. But the thing is, is it enough? Like, what does it mean when all of these projects start and many of them with the, a design that's based in the global north? And most of, as Amara already said, like m m the most consequences of mineral extraction, different kinds of neo-extractivisms are actually happening in the, I don't like actually this expression, but you understand as global south, it's the majority of the world actually. So I would talk, let's pretend I didn't talk about the forest top down and I will restart because then I want to start a talk, uh, I would just say a comment then we, we can try, try to sum up. But I wanted to talk about displacement and about dispossession. Because what's really behind those forests burning, what's behind different kind of mega projects, and, and in this kind of, I include, for example, mining projects, agribusiness projects, I follow a lot of them projects, and even mega events. Because that's how I started following them when mega events were happening in the city where I, where I come from, Rio de Janeiro, when the World Cup and the Olympics happened at the same time. What happens, what, what kind of people, what's being displaced when the forest is burning, when people are being displaced? And usually you see some connections. So many communi traditional communities are being displaced, many indigenous communities, as I, I was also saying, uh, and many people that are organizing politically. It's not, of course, we can't romanticize, idealize and say it happens, but there are some connections. Many groups that are under displacement are trying to fight for different kinds of livelihoods or have different kinds of understanding of nature, for example, and different kinds of relations to the occupation of territory. So when we talk about a forest that is burning, about people being displaced, and it's very hard to estimate, I, I would not be honest if I say that I know how many people are being displaced by, for example, hydropower dams at the moment, but the estimatives are something around 80 million people all over the world, just about dams. And uh, in Rio de Janeiro, for example, 100,000 people were displaced by the, the mega events, just to give some, like, the di dimensions of displacement. We also see, so we see, um, 
it's not just a material displacement, but it's displacement of ways of thinking, of living, of relating to nature, of understanding technologies, what is technology, for how, how people understand technologies, what kind of things they are organizing in territories when a mega project comes, and why do they cross exactly those communities? So I bring that because I also think it can connect even with Berlin if we, thought, we think about what kind of communities are being displaced, if, if we think about a uh, house project and like the, the project houses, for instance, that almost do not exist anymore. Those are, uh, of course, it talks about class, about race, about sexual orientation, many queer communities, uh, migrant communities are under displacement everywhere. So, I would say for me, and, and, and in the case of Brazil, just to bring some, I don't know why I'm with many numbers in my head today, uh, but if we think we have numbers like people that have been murdered in the last year because they are environmental defenders. And according to the Global Witness, uh, uh, there were 27 people just in Brazil. But what do we mean about environmental defenders? 19 of these people were land rights defenders. And then we come to the main thing, how to connect, like I think we can look to many kinds of projects, can be mining, agribusiness, can be infrastructure to bring internet to some uh, communities, to countries, everything, depending on how they are decided, they are crossed by all these intersections of, of race, of class, of sexual orientation, of citizenship, citizenship ethnicity. So a kind of internet that I imagine as a journalist, an activist, researcher, uh, is an internet that is connected to land rights, is connect, it's an intersectional kind of understanding internet in a decentralized way, because monocultures are not, not just about agribusiness, monocultures are also about thinking, about, uh, yeah, about how we, we connect, about how we do communication and articulation to access to information and so on. I talked uh, too much, so I'll stop. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Thank you, Camilla. Um, is there any immediate reactions from you? Aymara, yeah. <laughs> yes, I have one reaction connected with international division of work because I think that re relates with what you are saying now. Um, when we create this division between global north and global south, we are also creating these barriers of who needs to deal with uh, raw materials, who has to offer water, energy, uh, labor rights for we to have here uh, green energy. And um, in, in, in our perspective from the global south, I'm saying as this um, force division, uh, it's, it's so difficult to enter in green markets here. It's so difficult to enter with justice. So we have um, a fight for land, how you are saying now. We have a fight for uh, access to nature. We have a fight for technology also. So democratization of technology all is, a, is a discussion that we can put in the center. What means for Bolivia, for example, to industrialize lithium? That we have to buy the technology from Korea, we have to buy the technology from the United States, from Germany, from China. China is concentrated 85% of batteries, lithium batteries production in this moment. So who has the technology, who has the knowledge, has the power. Let's divide this power. But not just to produce more, because it's also a discussion of uh, who consumes more. Who has the right even to, to use green cars? Who has the right to eat ecologic food? 
who has the right to sleep um, eight, ten hours because they have guarantee of a house, of a territory. And we are still fighting for water. So this is the opposite agenda that we have when we are talking about lithium, because lithium needs water to produce. And uh, if we're still buying raw, um, uh, technology, we will never be able to transform also our own conditions. So this discussion of intersectionality can't be a liberal discussion. Because, why I'm saying that? Because we have in our sustainable agenda, in general, intersectionality as a new topic. What we are saying, we're saying that indigenous people, that before they, we were not human beings, and we had this category, yes, between culture and nature, so where we put nature down and culture up, and which culture? Western culture. So in comparison of that, we have indigenous that nobody knows if they are human or not. I'm saying things that are still happening. Why? Because they don't need to drink, they don't need to eat, they don't need to sleep, they don't need to love. They live in the same territories where everything is happening. And this is an overlapping of categories. Class, gender, um, uh, racism, yes? that affect some bodies differently than others. So with that agenda, sustainability is making a lot of money because they say we are offering now opportunities for people, let's think in carbon offsettings, for them to continue building their economy. So we are paying the damages of the climate change, offering chances for other people to conserve their nature, to conserve the land and the forest. This conservation is so racist because we are saying that because you are indigenous, you have to take care of nature. Because nature is your nature, is our nature. So you take care of our nature at the same time that we're still consuming what we are consuming. So this crisis is also an epistemologic and ontologic crisis. When we are going to see nature in the center, when we are going to see that people who is involved in this nature is resisting as nature. And I'm not going to talk just about indigenous futurism. I'm going to talk about plant of futurism. So nature is resisting. And this resistance is an example of plurality, no monoculture, diversity, diversity of opportunities of building a different system where all of us are included. Yeah? So I provoke this in the table, imagining that you also have some ideas to share with us. Thank you so much. Um, I actually have a question for you, Lynn, like, because we're talking a lot about like open, like open data or information or also knowledge about these topics, as, like for you, for example, climate mitigation. So what is the current data situation like from your perspective? What is needed or... Where is the lack of knowledge? And do you also observe it similarly to Aymara that there is these monopolies um, with, with, when it comes to this um, data around climate? Or what is, what's, what's your opinion? Yeah, so um, that was also my reaction from, from hearing what you're saying. I mean, it's really, we see an incredible risk of concentration of power with digital technologies and especially with AI as well. Um, that's due to skills, that's due to infrastructure. It's just, um, we already see that, that most of what's happening is happening in, in very few big tech companies. And um, this is also a geographic concentration of power, so much of it is happening in North America and, and China. Um, so there's absolutely a risk of, of, of that to happen. And this is not big. Well, it's partially because data and, and code are held, being held back, but lots of it is actually already open source. But I see it's, it's, it's a it's an skills problem or a capacity problem that most of the training programs are in the US, for example, most of the universities that do that kind of research. And, um, and then quickly people also get absorbed by big tech. Um, so we have huge issues bringing um, people into small organizations, into um, small corporations, and um, you know they mostly they can make a lot of money in 
certain countries and certain companies. And it's really, really difficult then to say, no, I'm taking a pay, massive pay cut and I go work on a sustainability problem with a smaller organization. Um, so there's definitely danger of, of concentration here. And then on the data side, um, also in terms of which kind of problems get tackled, um, of, we see the same thing that there is a lot of data about um, Again, North America, Europe, um, but we have very much less data about the rest of the world, and that also informs which kind of problems get solved, um, how well um, these solutions perform elsewhere, because if we, let's say, train a machine learning algorithm on some remote sensing task on North America, it will naturally perform worse in other environments because we have different kinds of data. Um, so, so that problem also is absolutely there. We see that, of course, things like wildfires in, in California get addressed quite a bit by, with digital technologies. That's because it's right in front of Silicon Valley. Um, so, yeah, we definitely see that kind of patterns. Super interesting, thank you. Um, Julia, I would like to um, hand over to you. So, I mean, you've been in the open source space also since quite some time. You mentioned before like this community-based, community-based, I don't know, activism or working on projects. So I'm um, interesting maybe if you can share some learnings from your work, um, yeah, on opening up, opening up technology, but also yeah, what, 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 are, what are learnings from your side? Yeah, um, I'm just trying to connect some of the things that have been said because... Go for it. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest learning for myself as someone who used to work in a space that called themselves the digital rights space for like 10 years is to see how many topics are interconnected. We had a Digital Futures Gathering where Camilla and uh, Katrin were also part of with 50 plus civil society organizations in Berlin where we were trying to like move from like just preventing harms that a lot of the civil society organizations are doing super important work but then also what do we want to move towards? Uh, what are the visions that we have for the work that we are doing? What does winning look like for different fields? And um, when we were hosting this um, event, uh, a nonprofit organization from the UK called Foxglove brought uh, three content moderators to the conversation, um, content moderators from Facebook and TikTok that showed us how immediately connected digital rights are with labor rights, like what Camila said, like how is the internet connected to land rights, then how are um, digital topics connected to, to labor rights. So understanding how these topics intersect and connect, and then also understanding how people are organizing and fighting for rights in the space. Like when we look at content moderation, we often perceive these um, works as like low-skilled click work. Um, people who are working under very bad, traumatizing conditions who are shielding us from extreme content and violence online who are like compared to like higher uh, skilled tech workers are not yet organized because they have very strict NDAs because they are uh, working in a very highly surveilled work environment. So these content moderators are now trying to organize and some of you might ask like what does this have to do with sustainability? What does this labor organizing and fighting for, for labor rights have to do with the discussions that we're having here at this conference? And um, there are um, works councils or for example um, Amazon um, employees for climate justice so people organize on a labor around labor issues but then they're also pushing for more climate justice for holding their organizations and companies to account when it comes to these issues so this and I might be describing that in a very kind of vague way right now but for me it was it's eye-opening how these topics are interconnected and how we cannot like just look at one singular struggle without like also acknowledging labor rights at the same time yeah um, and then also this question of the future comes in right so like what kind of future are we actually walking towards Julia maybe because you've been working so much on this like 
Why is it so important to like meet together as a community in a gathering like what you've done and like really think about these futures? Like, why is it important to do this kind of work um, from interdisciplinary, intersectional angles? Yeah, we started the gathering out with a uh, quote by Gloria Steinem that says, without leaps of imagination or dreaming, um, we lose the excitement for possibilities, for what's possible, because dreaming, after all, is a form of planning. So stepping away from the status quo or like reflecting on the status quo and then trying to envision like where do we want to go like what are the narratives um, that help us to rally people behind our causes is super important in the civil society space and it's something where there is often a lack of resources um, a lack of resources that enables us to create and hold these spaces together and to invite like other perspectives in like the perspective of the content moderators and, and their working conditions. Um, and then collectively like fleshing out, mapping out and also discussing about what gives us hope. There was wor one workshop around hope, I don't know who participated in it, um, but it was very popular uh, to not only talk about the grievances but also to look at the things that we've accomplished and to learn from um, community um, activities and um, to learn from like labor rights struggles but also other struggles where there's already been a lot accomplished so how, what how can we use these strategies and methods and project them into the future yeah thank you so much Camilla um, in our prep call we also talked a bit about um, like taking these contexts into consideration or these intersectionalities and do you have some thoughts on this um, or some other thoughts that you want to react to maybe also to Aymara? Uh, about intersectionality in, 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 with digital rights and the yes. environment. Uh, I think because I think I tried to, what I was talking before was mainly based like from a, an intersectional perspective or like uh, imbricacion, the, the oppression is um, from a, a Dominican, let's say, activist researcher, Oti Curiel, that's also part of GLEFAS, uh, the group that Aymara takes part, part as well and it's an amazing group, so that's why I'm mentioning again. Um, so I think, yeah, we have to, th there are many ways of understanding intersectionality as well, because the term got very popular and we have those problems with all the terms that get very popular and we just use it so much that sometimes it is disconnected from where it comes. So, uh, thinking what comes to my mind and I know one of the criticisms about it and it's very important is when it's disconnected from what we we all were saying so um, from the roots from what kind of struggles come a, a term as intersectionality and it's a lot based in race struggles like in struggles anti racism and uh, and the, those intersections with class and so on. So um, to think about, we can make a, maybe <laughs> make a parallel, it's coming to my, to my mind and it's connecting with what we were discussing on how also we use the term sustainability. And I think sustainability was a term that it's rooted already, I think it's different because it's rooted already in, in a very corporative setting. Like sustainability comes from discussions that since the beginning had the, the idea of the sustainable development comes from the idea of keeping development going on somehow and making adaptations and, and proposing those systems but, but the limits of the growth, the, the report from Club de Roma is 30, 30 years now, 50 years now. <laughs> yeah, and it is still a, a, a big reference, but it's very important to understand from which perspective, and it 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 comes from understanding uh, sustainability from uh, the the idea of growth, 
the idea of progress. And those ideas, if they are not contextualized, they can also bring a lot of what people are calling environmental colonialism. So we talk about data colonialism, uh, Lynn was talking about the, the, the dangers that can happen in the increase of uh, power concentration. And I think ideas behind the green can also cause a lot of harm, depending on how we understand them, what kind of um, understanding zone or about the nature are we talking about? Like there is a global crisis, yes, but are we all in the same boat? No, of course not. So, don't, yeah, don't know. yeah, we are both mics. I wanna, do you want to um, react to this? Like maybe you can talk a bit more about this because you've been working also a lot on this critique of sustainable development and also this notion of neo extractivism, which I would be really interested if you could share some thoughts with us um, because yeah it's also a new term for me so yeah from your perspective what are your thoughts super thank you for uh, relocating the discussion in new extractivism because it is a new technologic term we are building this term also we have the poli policies in technology yes so new extractivism we understand as a combination between actors that come from the state and actors that come from the market, that both together repeat extractive activities. For example, with food production, we are saying that we have a food crisis, so there is food insecurity, and the alternative is to jump to monocultures, and we are transforming landscapes to produce more food. So this narrative is a new extractive narrative that comes behind a mega infrastructure. So we have in Latin America, Irsa Cosi Plan. So they are two plants that has more than 10 years. They are building uh, tra uh, um, train systems, uh, uh, roads, uh, infrastructure for producing um, transformative options for the economy. So there is also enchantment there. So that means that many indigenous communities, indigenous leaders, most of the male indigenous leaders, they are engaged with these ideas of transforming the economy, taking raw materials for their own places to have some benefits. Yeah. And that includes food, that includes uh, water extraction. So <laughs> participation, I think it's a topic that we can discuss in this space. Participation and inclusion when we talk about uh, democratization of options. I wanted to share with you something that um, for me is um, a challenge. 2022, this year, we had an increase of raw materials demand around the world. I'm not saying that. This is part of the results of United Nations Human Development Report. So we have less resources, biggest demand, and we have the increase of authoritarianism around the world. So we are losing democratic systems. Liberal democratic systems, uh, they are not perfect, they are still uh, offering oppression to many people, but we are losing democratic systems. So in a planet of, with crisis, political crisis, technology, is also a discussion of geopolitics. And when we imagine this uh, fig um, figure, this picture that is in the top, probably we can't uh, look for options, but actually options are there. They multiply not just because we have one enterprise dealing with uh, agroecology. I'm talking about one technology. What means agroecology? That we produce food, building chances for the rest of life in that same land to continue living with us. Ecological production, farming, uh, build it with indigenous and uh, with a small farming production. All of those type of technologies that we have, traditional technologies, they can be part of our daily life also as an option. But if we are count, always is the same narrative. Uh, one big enterprise can transform the economy of one country, but 
thousands of small initiatives, they are just local initiatives. So it's also to change the perspective of who is doing the, the option, the, the, the alternative. And this is a future possible. If we decide how we want to self-determinate our territories, how to deal with our modernity, how to deal with our technology to share options for life, we will change this system. It's my thought. Yeah? Thank you. Um, everyone is writing down a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> do you still want to share something with us? Otherwise, I would maybe do a small exercise with the audience. So, I would just add one thing to what Aymara just said. Uh, when I talk about, talked about displacement, for example, it's interesting also to see how many communities engaged, for instance, in agroecology are also being displaced. So once we are talking about alternatives that are trying to resist, and in many cases, you have, we have on the one part of the world like a, a alternative, not alternatives, but systems that are there for so many decades, centuries, trying to resist while other kinds of solutions top down are coming to sometimes the same territories and displacing by some kind of techno solutionisms. Which is also the reason why you're working a lot on land rights, right? Maybe you can also explain this angle a bit more because it's also a bit um, complex. Like, why is it so important to think about land rights? Basically, because all the systems we are discussing about and internet, one being one of them, I don't know if I can call system, but Julie can help me in that. <laughs> but I mean, part of infrastructures, um, all of them need land. We are not talking about abstract things that sometimes we have this feeling that we talk about clouds and things that are somewhere else, but they are very rooted. On the one hand, because all the data centers that need all the, the, the natural resources, I even, I mean, natural resources and 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 also space to, because now that the big tech, for example, they really like jumping into techno solutionism, so they cause the problem, but they also offer solutions. So it's a very big deal because they, they, there are many projects in, in partnership, for example, with municipalities. There are many projects that are questionable, you know, uh, I mean, I think the, the process is more about who is deciding about it, who is involved. So it's the whole thing about who is taking decisions about an occupation of land. And sometimes in the, those cases, there are different kinds of um, displacement. There are different kinds of invasions of territories. So that's why looking through land rights is very interesting. It's also the, the most difficult, even for journalists, if we look at the case of Brazil, maybe you heard about there is one journalist that was murdered, Don Phillips, a British correspondent in Brazil, and he was an environmental journalist. But what was he investigating? Land rights. So th this is like pointing the finger in, in some places I think we need to go and collectively, because alone is uh, impossible. Communities. <laughs> okay, I feel like um, I would like um, now the audience to maybe take um, like a few minutes, two, three minutes, um, either on your own or if you're comfortable speaking with a neighbor, um, just putting down some notes, maybe some questions that you would like to ask. Um, discuss a bit what, yeah, what kind of um, topics we've been talking about, and then we are um, gonna open up for a round of questions and um, do another closing um, round of closing statements. So I'm gonna let me check. Yeah, maybe for two minutes you can just talk a bit, and then um, we're gonna see what the questions are. What, what is the closing statement about? Can you ask Katrin? Yeah. 
Okay, um, is there some thoughts or questions, please? Um, thank you all for the very fascinating discussion. I really appreciate you bringing up the fact that folks from the larger world are expected to both develop and also provide all the resources and also sustain themselves. But I feel like this, um, I'm going to call this like the between the overdeveloped world and then the overextracted world. It's, it's expected that that the current, like the overdeveloped world, maintains its current level of development, but also that the global south has to catch up and develop and be eventually as good as them. Even though we know that right now, um, with being in the middle of this climate crisis, that this is not sustainable in any way or shape or form. So, um, I was wondering if you had sort of like any. Uh, bald visions, as Catherine called it, for how a de-developed global north might look like, or... Sorry, Tar could you say one more, once more your question, how a developed? Uh, how, if you had any sort of uh, visions or for futures of... Because we never hear the other side of the discussion, that what things that absolutely need to happen, which is a de-developed global north, or what would that look like? How, how, how will we get there? Uh, that's, that's, I find that's something that I'm always looking for in these discussions, but we almost never get there, so I was wondering if you had any visions for that. I can say two things connected with this. I don't know if it's the same line that you are asking, because English is not my mother tongue, so I don't know if I catch you. Um, historical devolution, is in the center of our agenda. So we have to discuss again who is responsible of this historical damage. The second reconnection, um, it, it, it seems that the resonance of what is happening there and here can be part of the same agenda. So reconnection, like, uh, uh, what you say that, that some minutes ago, we have oligopolies concentrating the benefits. More than 60% of each uh, pro si production system is in hand of big companies. They look like God, the new gods of the future, right? But we can transform this to plurigods. To, to pluri options of transforming. So, reconnection between consumers and producers, reconnection, closing the, the, the value chain, uh, transforming benefits, who benefit from that? So, if we think in justice from the global north from, to the global south, it's not just to close the pipe and to, to rethink in how to consume as an, an individual. We need to open chances to create this dialogue, and technology and internet has a lot to offer with that. Decentralization of technology towards democratization and participation of each actor to do this transformation is necessary yeah, for a systemic change. Do you want to add something, Camilla? Or no? Because you were like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think I might have said many of the things. Uh, um, I would just uh, say that there is actually one very big movement and actually it's uh, usu usually called degrowth. And th this is the, the biggest um, discussion in, in Europe f 
about like kind of changing the system and, and slowing down and so on. But then I get back to what I might already said. That is, I, I've been involved in some of these discussions, but when it's not through a lens that is about colonialism and all these intersections, it seems also very dangerous because the global north will keep, you know, like the, the power of decisions, even about slowing down and what causes. In, in, we are all, co it, it's every, everything's connected, it's transnational. So. But the debate exists, and it's interesting to follow. Is there another question? Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, first of all, it has been amazing. Everything you've said, my respects. <laughs> I'm uh, curious now. Uh, I come from Mexico, my partner and I, and we have a, an NGO. And we work, and now that I heard the, the term Global South, which is new for me, <laughs> I think we work with the south of the global south, you know, like the real, real, real marginalized communities, indigenous communities. I agree, um, internet brings opportunities, but I think it also brings risks. I'm curious of what you think of, about the risks of bringing internet to marginalized communities, that it's their first contact with the internet. I'm thinking, for example, I don't want them to go to Facebook, you know? <laughs> I don't want them to, or maybe yes, but do you, can you comment or react on or, or the risks of bringing internet to marginalized indigenous communities? That will be Me? super helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, because I'm going to talk about your territory also. Zapatista movement connected with Kurdistan and with Bolivia as a social movement from, from Chapare, they are using internet for this new internationalism, transnational social movements dealing together to learn how, learn from each other to imagine f different futures. So it's not just a sense of offering technology because people, they are so intelligent. They can use in favor of transformation. So in Brazil, we had the same experience. Women, international women, they say, okay, we know that everybody can see what we are doing in WhatsApp. So now we are going to use Facebook to put our ideas. So who is in the opposite side of us will learn, but we also will split information. It's a good opportunity for us to create this new internationalism. And for that reason also we are here. Come on, I am in Germany all the time dealing with the fact that we as immigrants, we are cleaning your places, we are producing your food, but we are not in the center of the discussion in academic spaces. How important is to put our voices, and for that we need technology. Yeah, just as, as part of uh, my feelings connected with this. And I mean, there's so many obvious challenges that we're going to explore, right? Surveillance, like the surveillance capitalism that we have online, like that is just looking to exploit the data to, in order to like provide you with ads and sell you products, disinformation. We've seen that as a big challenge as well with new communities that are getting online that do not have the, like, I hate the word digital literacy, but what are facts, what is this information that is being spread, and we've seen many democracies struggle um, under this. And this, these are the things, these are two, just two things that we're uh, going to export, and um, yeah, there's certainly many more. Like, I don't know what you can think of aside from surveillance and um, misinformation problems that we're exporting. Also the fact that the majority of the tech gets built um, by like a very, um, homogeneous group of people, so you having access doesn't immediately also mean that you have the means to build, um, to shape the space. Um, so we're extracting the minerals from certain parts of this world, but then when it comes to building the software and the tools, this is very centralized in a few places uh, where we are building, where people are building tools for the majority or what they perceive as the majority. Um, and so many other needs and demands are like fall short. Uh, and thank you also to, sh uh, to share. Uh, I'm curious now also about your organization, but we can talk. 
Thank you. Uh, I would say also just to include the other part of the thing Julia just said, like centralized. Well, I'm part of a collective from Brazil called Intervozes. We fight for democratization of media. And we have a project, for example, called Free Technologies, Free Territories. And I think there are many, there are most of the technologies and internet systems we know, they are very centralized, but there are other ways of doing that, like local networks and those kind of stuff. And we should all know about it. And, and I think this is one of the main things. One indigenous leader in Brazil, when I interviewed her for I interviewed her many times to, during these last years, and one of the things she says is, I don't want internet if it means losing my territory. So I don't want any, uh, just any kind of internet. I want to be, I want my community, because it's not, I, want, I don't remember exactly the quote, but it's in the direction of, um, I want my community to decide what kind of internet we will have because if not, we can lose other rights. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing. So how we can do it from another point of view and uh, amplify different kinds of technologies and ways of connecting that are not centralized. I think this is the, also for journalists, for communicators, for all of us, it's, it's the main thing. Misinformation is also huge in, in, about the environment, about climate uh, in this moment because of the, co the corporations that control our uh, communication systems. It's too centralized right now. Thank you for the question. Thank you, and we will send you information. <laughs> One last question. One, two, three. <laughs> Thought? Okay. Oh, okay. I just wanted to share a positive example and I work for a project. We organize citizen assemblies in small municipalities all over Germany and we are using a software called Consul. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it was invented in, in Madrid and there were the indignados, there were protests and then the city of Madrid created this platform, an open source platform, so people can actually uh, post their ideas and share ideas and organize the city and um, yeah, I think it's a very nice example of uh, like a, a building a just and sustainable future and I wonder maybe this could be something that can be exported. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Can you tell us the name of the software again, please? It's called Consul or the Consul Foundation and I know it's being used uh, all over Europe, maybe even in um, abroad, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's used for citizen participation, right? So that citizens can get in touch with their local politicians, but also make proposals, talk about um, community budgeting, like a budget is allocated and then you decide and deliberate on where you want to spend this, what you want to spend this budget on. Um, these are tools that are certainly important when it comes to leveraging um, the internet and the digital technologies that we have, especially when it comes to increasing transparency also on like uh, political decision making so that people can keep track on what is being discussed, what is being decided, how they can um, bring their own ideas into the discussion and see what others around them think. So these deliberative tools, we've seen that um, in Taiwan as well, when it comes to discussions around certain regulations, I think they started out by discussing how Uber should be regulated. Um, and by having these courses that do not necessarily lead to a divide, but that center around um, how do you f finding consent. So when we look at social media platforms and like people commenting like a lot of hateful comments on statements that people are making there's also digital participation tools that are focusing around uh, consent polis is one of them that would be an example where people 
can like submit ideas, but they can not comment on other ideas. They can like rate other ideas up and like create their own ideas and see how the consent bubbles are moving and like what the different opinions in the space are. So I think these experiments are, in, are interesting and can definitely be helpful for um, improving the democracies we live in and the voices that get heard in these democracies. So building it also into the technology and like really making sure that it's around consent and not about polarization, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you so much. I think this was a lot of content. Um, I think my main takeaways were like being aware of context and um, really working with intersections and like trying to bring all these different perspectives and different um, lived experiences together. Um, we also talked about monocultures or in general monopolies and um, how important it is to really um, bring them down <laughs> and yeah, work against that. And then obviously we also talked about open data, we talked about um, climate mitigation and also about indigenous rights and indigenous lands. So I would like to close this round um, because you are all working actually on really, really great projects. So is there something that people can um, follow on or can look up? Or is there also some last final thoughts that are still on your mind and that you would like to say? I can maybe um, share another positive example. I um, co-founded an organization with now more than 50 volunteers and even some staff um, members. And we we were totally online. Like we have met mostly in the digital space and we run the entire organization in the digital, digital space. Of course, people meet each other in person every now and then around the world. Um, but of course, without um, the internet, we, we couldn't have even gotten together and have like a a global community around a topic. Now, our topic is climate change and, and machine learning, um, but, you know, digital tools made this possible. But what we found is that, you know, the social tissue, but, you know, the, the connections and the organizational form behind us is, I think, the, the main driving force. Um, it's just that we are able to meet, you know, on a daily basis online, but um, it still needs people and, and agendas and topics to achieve something. Oh, yeah. um, so earlier this year we launched 25 feminist tech principles and we're now exploring, so the principles go from equity and visibility along the um, supply chain to uh, designing for uh, informed consent and many others and we're now exploring how we can feed these principles into policy discussions. Um, and it's 25 principles, uh, sorry, 12 principles um, by 25 people from around the globe. Um, so this is one thing that we're working on, where we're looking for collaborators that understand policy processes, that have an overview of what's going on and where, where we can um, connect with these principles. Also, the German digital strategy now has a short paragraph on digital tech pol or feminist tech policy. So this could be a jumping off point for these discussions. And then we're also looking at societal risk assessment. So oftentimes when we look at, at risk assessments in tech, we're... So there's such a strong focus on the individual because the regulators are looking at it through a consumer um, protection lens. Um, but what would a framework look like that can help us to um, talk about the envir environmental and sustainable harms? Um, yeah, and we are exploring how such a framework would help us to better assess the risks of some of the technologies that are being built right now. So if people are interested in these topics, this is something we're working on at Super. Um, and yeah, please join us in, in this work. Nice, thank you. Camilla, do you want to go next? Yeah, before I just wanted to mention the name because sometimes I, I keep talking and thinking at the same time, but the indigenous leader that I mentioned because I was like, I didn't mention Alessandra Munduruku in case people want to also get to know her because she's amazing. And yeah, I mean, my collective that I mentioned is called Intervozis, so we are 
more than 100 people in Brazil fighting for media democratization. So we try to find the intersections on the one hand uh, among monopolies, so digital monopolies. Now we are launching a book about that. Uh, land monopolies and traditional media monopolies because in Brazil we have a very concentrated media. So our biggest problem some years ago when I entered the collective was the concentration of media, traditional media in the hands of private companies in Brazil. Now our, our, <laughs> our challenge got much bigger with all the transnational corporations on communication, but we also try to bring the, the other possibility. So we work with different communities and we are part of as well, not just work with, but we are very different people um, working on local and feminist from, from any perspectives of, of media. Yeah, and I have the project Beyond the Green in, in case people want to, like I'm it's, it's a project I'm fighting for, but with the aim of bringing together f uh, feminist lenses, different formats of investigation about all these topics, about mainly mega projects, so bringing art, journalism, research, activism, and I have been doing this in the last years and hope to continue and have more things about it. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm Ara. <laughs> Thank you. I will connect with the idea of uh, digitalization. Um, oral voices um, in front of us are so vulnerable in this moment because orality as a strategic, as a an traditional strategic from uh, territories uh, was an option to share knowledge from the past to the present, how we say in, the, in, in Aymara's perspective, Aymara is the name of my own place, my own nation too. We say, put the past in the front to go to the future. And uh, in, in this case, orality can be transformed by digitalization. So how can we also rethink technology to share our own plural uh, systems of thinking and uh, this is one option that comes for all of us to imagine not monocultures, but pluricultures. So uh, I was imagining the future as a future where we are still alive. And who will tell this story? This story will be told by the protagonists of this story. So it's a, a, a great opportunity this moment to create these platforms where we can uh, imagine different, uh, different connections b between territories. We are doing now uh, in Glefas, that is the space where I'm working as an activist, we are doing this uh, small schools we call anti-racist schools. In those places, one strategy that is so important is to share knowledge on internet. Why they are doing that? Because in IT, we are working now in Republica Dominicana and IT, internet connection is very low. But what is going on in IT is affecting the whole system. So we need to hear what is going on there. Which voices we are going to elevate. This has to be a bottom-up initiative, not a top-down initiative. So it's, it's reimagine the future also with others who are not just the vulnerable, they're closing this binarism of vulnerability and privileges or men and women or south and north, how we integrate this system because all of us, we are here. Yeah? Great, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for coming and for your interest. And thank you to all the panelists for all your thoughts and ideas and sharing all of that with us. So yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>